Last two classes, I'm going to go over Dolan today. I'm going to do some review, catch up, get forward. We've been talking about this material, but I was looking through the chapters, so uh, I want to talk about uh, the material in chapters 2 through 6 today, and then, or 2 through 5, and then 6, 7, 8 in the climate change appendix on Tuesday next week. Um, I'm also, I've got an email, I got an email from you, right? Uh, I'm, got some, uh, I'm looking for some emails from you f with questions of general nature, stuff that you didn't get during the class. Um, and I'll be answering those questions next week uh, on the second half of the, the lecture. So, um, in Dolan, let's go back and think about the, the quiz question that I gave you, which was, why do politicians like the CAFE fuel standards, the corporate average fuel economy standards, that's the United States, but it could be anywhere. So why CAFE versus uh, a price? And the answer on that was what? Everybody went back and did the reading, right? Or did I say the answer in the class or after the test? Or what was, what was, the, what was the answer for that? Why do politicians prefer fuel standards to raising the price of fuel in terms of uh, reducing consumption of fuel. Right, so because they don't want to make, so it's a paradox. They want people to use less fuel, but they don't want people to know they're using less fuel. They don't want to, in a sense, they don't want to take the blame for using less fuel. Uh, and if you put a, cor a corporate average fuel economy standard, then someone has to buy a car, and in the old days, the car might have, here's our famous car, look at that. My, my car designer future is insured to never happen. So you have a car, and in the old days, it would be a big car, and they say, no, we're going to make it a smaller car so it gets better fuel economy. And as a consumer, you don't necessarily notice this because you only buy a car every three years or five years or 20 years, right? On the other hand, if you raise the price of fuel from 130 a liter to 150 a liter, a liter, everybody knows immediately. That's why there's protests. That's why there's riots in Nigeria and Malaysia and Indonesia and Iran when they raise the price usually a subsidized price in those countries, but when they raise the price. There were protests in England several years ago when they raised the price of fuel. Politicians don't like having that kind of uh, response, and so on the one hand, they hope that this kind of corporate average fuel economy will actually deliver the results. On the other hand, they can just say, we're doing something about that, check, I'm done with that policy, now let's go on to uh, the next airplane or opening a shopping center or kissing babies. But if you actually say uh, you're going to raise the price of fuel, this, the, right, the uh, price increase of fuel could easily be five times more effective than changing the fuel economy standards. If you look at all the costs and benefits. Uh, from a social perspective, it's much better. But the who bears the costs is the politician today. And who gets the benefits is society tomorrow. Right? That's the, that's the difference. Hold on just a second. I always forget if this is going. Yeah, okay. Okay, so we have to do some laps this morning. Ah, that was light. lovely. So we have to think about who has the cost and who has the benefits, right? Now, the, Be the Beijing pollution question is really interesting to me because of this paradox. If you're a leader in China, it's very likely that you live in Beijing. And if you are pursuing growth as the goal of China and as your political legacy, then you would say growth is good, growth is good, but then you're also experiencing the pollution from that legacy. Then theoretically you would say, wait a second, growth is good, but I can't breathe and I'm the leader of this country. From an individual perspective even, the person is suffering. From a social perspective, everybody who lives in the area, of course, is also suffering. But I really wonder about that, um, and one, one part of me thinks that the, the, the leadership of the Central Committee probably lives somewhere outside of Beijing. I'm not quite sure about that. Or their families live outside of Beijing. This is what happens with wealthier uh, people, of course. Um, 
But if you're a politician and you and your family live in Beijing and you're saying, we have to have growth, but we can't breathe, there's immediately a, a benefit cost that's occurring at the same spot. So it's, it's, it's strange to me that the pollution has gotten so bad around Beijing that that hasn't um, uh, been tackled more uh, ruthlessly, except for, of course, for the Olympics. On the other hand, there, there could easily be uh, a problem that the center, which is, a, which is an ongoing problem in China, and, and it's a problem at every government level. You've got, you've got the federal level or the state. Then you've got the local, let's just say local level. And if the local level is, is in charge of the, the factories, and the federal level is in charge of whatever, the policy, right? They're writing the policy, but these guys are in charge of the factories. These guys might say, your salary depends on GDP in your area. And the, and the local guys say, okay, we're going to pursue GDP. We're going to have factories that are pr putting out a lot of production for, for, gro for product, gross domestic product. But it also produces, so it produces money and pollution. And the, the local guys are saying, uh, I'm, getting, I'm, I'm doing my job, I'm pr producing the, the money or the, you know, I'm producing the money which shows up on my report to my boss and my boss says, okay, I will promote you. But also I'm producing money and maybe I'm getting rich, right? Because a lot of uh, politicians at local levels have uh, interests in these factories. But then there's this negative impact, which is the pollution. And it's, it's a well-known problem in, in China, the same way as it's a well-known problem in Canada and in the United States and in other countries that local production may, uh, in Alberta with its oil sands or around Beijing with those factories, the local production might be helping one group but harming a larger group, harming society in a sense, or in the case of uh, oil, harming the entire world. So on the one hand, the federal side is saying you have these targets to meet and the local guys are saying we're meeting those targets. On the other hand, if the federal guys say, oh, you should meet those targets but don't do this, don't pollute, then the local guys are like, we're, we're pollution. if we cut back on pollution, it's going to cost us money, right? We have to spend money to reduce the pollution. Either, either we shut down, whoever had the blog post, it was really funny, about they shut down the factory on Monday and Wednesday so it officially is not polluting. That was awesome, right? That was, that was ridiculous. It was great. But we, we're not officially polluting, um, and that's one way of dealing with it. But on the other hand, they usually say, we don't want to incur those costs. We want to uh, keep doing business, and that makes us look good professionally. Uh, and the pollution is what? It's an externality. It affects other people, right? So what has happened in, in China in many cases is that the federal government has actually lost control of provincial uh, leaders because the provincial leaders they say we're going to put a new airport here even though there's two more airports within 100 kilometers or we're going to open up another cement factory or we're going to put another housing development because the personal benefits or the local benefits are much greater than the national costs or the sorry than the local costs the national costs are also there right so um, and in terms of it could be China's carbon footprint for example that could be a national cost and in Beijing they might worry about the carbon footprint but the local guys don't care about the carbon footprint for the country. They care about keeping the factory going and those jobs right in their local vicinity. Right? So there's a, there's an a, what I'm saying here is there's an asymmetry of costs and benefits. And if you don't have all of the costs and benefits on the same person or the same group of people, then you're going to have a problem politically. Right? So if you guys are getting the benefits and you guys are getting the costs, we already know this is a problem right? from a political perspective. And we want to make sure the costs and benefits line up, which is... Uh, uh, a, a zero externality situation. No, there's no communication barrier. The communication is very clear, saying do something, and they are totally ignoring the communication in the local level, right? So in some, and there's different ways of ignoring this, right? There's, so they could say, oh yeah, yeah, we're doing something. Oh sure, yeah, we're doing something. And Guangdong, we put in a fuel economy standard, and this is totally going to take care of the pollution. But it's a regulation that isn't necessarily enforced. It's not necessarily written well. The headline says what it's supposed to do. But what you could actually do if you wanted to be very effective is do this. So the locals, if locals have the ability to, inf to implement the law in their own way, they can do that. Right? That's why it was very interesting that the city, the city of the government is discussing uh, markets for pollution in China. Right? Because that uh, that's an idea 
of uh, showing the, var or the various regions have, an, have a, either a cost of not, uh, they, have a, they have a benefit from polluting less, or they have a cost of not participating in the market because they're going to lose money. So that's one way of aligning incentives. That's another, that's another way of aligning incentives. Um, and in the, in the book, he, uh, Dolan, uh, he's, 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 he's studied in Russia, uh, sorry, study. He, he was teaching in Moscow. And I've visited most of these ex-Soviet countries. I've visited a lot of, uh, I've visited Vietnam and Cuba and China and other countries that have some form of state control. I've also visited, of course, lots of capitalist countries that are not very capitalist. And um, the interesting thing is that the, when you lack accountability for the use of the uh, resources in the country uh, in the sense that some group gets the benefit of the resources and another group gets the cost. That's the accountability problem. It's a lack of property rights, for example. So uh, anybody can, can chop down the tree that belongs to the people. It's a lack of uh, profit maximization. So people with a firm are not pursuing profits uh, uh, or efficiency. They're pursuing jobs, for example. Uh, if you have these kinds of uh, uh, non-capitalist targets, you can get all kinds of, of uh, bad outcomes. And it's tricky because profit maximization is a very evil thing to some people. But the alternative can be worse because it's not transparent. We don't know why. In the book, he gives the example of, uh, you know, the, US, the, the USSR and China and the USA all have the same problems. But he says, if there's not a price system, then you don't know how much those resources are worth that you're using up, right? You get, the, you get a quota of uh, inputs, uh, or you have a, you're given a forest to, take, uh, to, to use in terms of process, and there's no price system. So you, if you get this forest, and you can't necessarily sell it, there's no price for it, you're just going to use it. It's the same thing as the water sector, where farmers very, very often have gotten water on this piece of land for 100 years or for 500 years, and they just use the water. And they don't necessarily think the water is worth anything. The water just shows up and they use it. If there is uh, a price for the trees or the oil or the people or the water or the land, if there's a price, then they say, I'm going to use $100 of water and I'm going to make $80 of profit. Or I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to use $100 of water and I'm going to make $80 of sales, revenue, right? I'm going to lose $20. If someone's facing that kind of simple numeric example, they'll be like, why am I using $100 of water to make $80? Why don't I sell the $100 of water to somebody else and don't even work at all, right? So in fact, labor-free, you make more money than if you actually use the water. So not having a price is a big problem. And we want to have prices. And resources are very simple to price. We've talked about that this whole class. And, in, and if you're going to ever look for a resource problem, you'll want to say, is this resource being priced, whether it's oil or land or labor or uh, uh, water and so on. So we know that in systems where the price is not there, people make decisions that may not be very good um, as far as maximizing the benefit of the resources. If the resources don't belong to anybody, it's all of our forest, I'll chop it down and you guys pay the price. It's a, another problem because this is a tragedy of the commons. I use your property uh, for my own personal profits. That's another issue, right? So there, these, the examples that I'm bringing up here are where resources are going to be mismanaged because they're not being managed as private goods. If you manage a resource as a collective good or as a common pool good, there's going to be a, a, a tragedy of the commons on, from a social perspective, but they're also going to be one group taking advantage of another group, whether it's going to be uh, the, the consumption of oil or the consumption of water. In Nigeria, the government of Nigeria has lost billions and billions of dollars, lost it. It's stolen, right, through corruption. They've lost, I don't even know if they, $50 billion or so of oil over the years. If you look at Iraq, it's the same thing. All the money from selling the oil comes into the ministry and it goes out to a bunch of friends of the government and the people who are citizens of the country do not get any money, let alone jobs, let alone you know, social services like education or roads or, or, or even uh, public security. Right? In those countries uh, you have uh, private security because uh, the government doesn't even function. 
So these are, these are, these are big political problems, but the political problems are co more common in resource-intense countries where the resources are not being managed on behalf of the people. In the book, uh, Dolan talks about the equimarginal principle. The equimarginal principle is jargon. It's economic terminology. It means, at the margin, we're all, uh, or we're all seeing the same uh, margin, we're all seeing the same price, really. And at the margin, which is determined by that price, we are all consuming according to what makes sense to us. What, the way to look at this, which sounds really very academic and boring, let's do it this way. The way to look at this is to say, this is a split demand curve here. And by that, I mean I've got price up here like any demand curve. And here's one demand, demand from person one. And here's another demand, demand from person two. This is just two different people's demand curves. Okay? So zero is in the middle, and quantity is increasing in either direction. It's just two different people. The only reason I draw this is because I want you to see two demand curves next to each other. Is that clear enough? Okay. Now, we know that the first unit that this person consumes is worth more to that individual than the first unit this person consumes, just because of the shape of the demand curves. Okay. And if we were going to have an auction for one unit of the good, Mr. One would win the auction, because he's a higher willingness to pay, unless he's like asleep or whatever, but a normal, under normal conditions. What the equimarginal principle means, really, is that if you have a price, which is a flat line there, if you have a price in the market or from the administration or anybody else and you're allocating according to price, then both of those people are going to consume as many units of the good until the marginal benefit and the marginal cost are equal, right? That's equimarginal. So you've got this consumption here and this consumption there. And so this is going to be Q2 star and this will be Q1 star. That's just the way any market allocation would work. It's the market for shoes, it's the market for coffee, it's the market for rental property. Again, we're assuming everything is, these are homogenous goods, but this is how markets will work. And at the margin, this is what we would want. This is efficient. This seems very obvious, but a lot of resources and a lot of goods are not allocated this way, which is where there's a problem, right? Say that uh, you want to drive a car around Beijing, and uh, you have a demand for driving, and your demand curve for driving looks like that, and your demand curve for driving looks like your D1 and your D2, right? Who's D1? Your D1? Your D2. Your D2, you want to drive more than he wants to drive just looking at those two demand curves. If there were market pricing for that driving, then we would get into this efficient situation. But what if instead we say, your license plate can drive on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and your license plate can drive on Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday? Suddenly they're equal in terms of the quantities they consume, and each of them gets to consume one unit, or whatever you want to call it, the equal amount. From a social perspective, this is not efficient. From an economic perspective, it's not efficient. Now what you end up doing is you end up unscrewing your license plate and putting it on his car, right? So that, or the other way around. I can't remember who's who now. Are you, you want to drive more or you do? Or are you one or two? You're one. Okay, you're one, you have a high value. So you're willing to pay him, at least for the next unit, Right? You're not even interested in driving yet. So you would pay him, whatever, 100 RMB, to borrow his license plate for the day. That assumes that they can find each other. So we're talking about transaction costs now. Right? If the price had just been out there, you'd be like, I put my, I, I put my credit card in and I get to drive. Right? I mean, you could, have, you could have it. You could have a toll road. You could have a congestion charge like in London. You could have a gasoline, uh, a gasoline price. Say that in, in, in Beijing, if they want to end the problem, they put four, four, the equivalent of four US a liter, 
Boy, you're going to have fewer drivers, aren't you? What's the price right now? About one? One Canadian, one US? How much is it for, for petrol in China? Anyone? Less than $4? Oh, yeah? That's 25, 25 RMB, more or less, right? Quiet. What? Nine? OK, nine. So we go from nine to 25. Now, what happens? Protests. You're raising the price of fuel. No, instead, we're going to do this thing which is more fair, but totally inefficient. And unfortunately, it, it, can, it can lead to, well, it'll lead to inefficiency more than corruption necessarily. Let's assume even the police are going to do their job. But the transaction costs are crazy. Right? You have to have someone going around and looking at every stupid license plate to try and cut that down. And still, there's too many cars. Right? You haven't gotten rid of the problem. So not using the price mechanism means that you're going to have inefficiencies in, in many, many ways. In this case, we have an inefficiency with resource consumption, but much more importantly for Beijing, for air pollution. And you could do the same thing in, in around Beijing if you wanted to for uh, the factories, right? industry. You want to manufacture and you want to put out pollution, you're going to have to buy a permit. It's going to cost whatever, a lot of money per, per ton of pollution or SO2 or anything else like that. So command and control is, is appealing to people who say, you can't drive your car and you should eat more meat and you should drink more milk. Command and control is easy because I think I can control everybody. But the amount of information necessary to make command and control work correctly is unbelievable. In fact, it never happens. That's why it's totally inefficient. That's why when you're subject to command and control, you're so pissed off. You're so annoyed, right? If you go to, I, my example is, oh, I want to go to a country. And, and the, they say, oh, you want to come to our country? I said, yes. And they said, you want to apply for a visa? I said, yes. I said, how do I know, this happened to me, how do I know you want to leave the country? Well, you know, I'm a visitor. I don't really want to be an economic migrant. And they say, you have to prove to us that you want to leave the country. It's like, how do I prove I want to leave the country? When I get in the country, I'm there. And uh, how do I prove I leave except that I leave? How do I prove that before I get there that I want to leave? But they don't even know. If you put some incentives in place, it makes it easier. If we talk about this, just to jump ahead a little bit, this coming in the country discussion is very significant for countries that have migra migrants coming in, right? M migrants are coming in, whether it's in, in Europe and Northern Europe, where they have migrants coming from Southern Europe, or it's from North America, where they have migrants coming from Asia or from Latin America. The local people are like, oh my God, they're gonna take all our jobs, they're gonna take all our money, et cetera. And the migrants, they don't necessarily want to take the money. They want usually to work. And they usually want, or, they, or you guys are here to learn if you're coming in to learn, or they want to uh, be free to just not be hassled by their corrupt country. Corruption is a huge reason for migration. And the, 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 the problem is, is that the local people, the, the, the local citizens are saying, if you come in, You'll use our money to not work and use our health care and our education system and whatever. And the migrants are saying, no, we don't want to do that. We want to work. We want to pay taxes and so on. Well, the, 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 the political problem is that there is some uh, perception or assumption that the migrants are going to use all those services or that they have the right to use all those services. Well, the easy way to get rid of that problem is not let them. You say, you can come in, but you can't get free education, you can't get free health care, you can't get welfare for uh, not having jobs, and so on. That's not hard to do. But the politicians don't necessarily do that, and, it's, and it ends up being a tricky discussion. But the, what I'm getting at right now is that the, who bears the cost and who bears the benefits is super important. And if, if migrants could come in and say, number one, I will pay my medical insurance, number two, I will put a, a guarantee that... Uh, I ha number two, I have a job. That's how I got in here with a letter. I had a job. Hold on a second. And number three, uh, I'll have enough money in the account, in my bank account, and you could deport me if I don't. Why wouldn't that be a fair migration policy? If you can pay your way and you're not going to cost anybody any money, why not? And in Canada and the U.S., I know for sure, they say, oh, you say you can work. You want to be a, a carpenter or you want to be an engineer or you want to be a hairstylist. Well, you have to, you have to prove that you're not going to take a job away from a Canadian which is, ends up being a ridiculous, surreal thing, right? But that's how um, the politics works because people are so afraid of uh, losing, uh, in some ways, they're afraid of competing with the foreigners. 
but they're also afraid of paying money to someone who's not uh, doing their fair share. That's why migration is not such a big problem in, in countries where everybody uh, feels number one, feels safe, basically. Alex, what was your question? Mm -hmm. Right. And they said, like, through the immigration, that they have to prove that they have a job there, that they've had for right. a while, right. so that they won't just come here and start a new life. Right. They have to come back to that job, right. and that they have a substantial amount of money in a bank right. overseas. Right. So they have to go back and collect that money. Right. Pay. The best thing you can do is leave behind a, a wife or a husband. <laughs> Seriously. Like, and, and some countries, they. They'll let you leave, but like in the old, in the Soviet times, they would tell you this. You're an artist. You're a ballet artist or a, a painter or a singer. You can leave to go on tour in, in Paris and New York and so on, but we have your mother, we have your father, we have your children, we have your husband. The government would say this explicitly, and even because it was defection. They were worried about people leaving. Uh, the, the, the U.S. was very happy to take the defectors, but the Russians didn't want them to leave, right? So the government would hold hostage your children, and in the Canadian example of migration, they're saying, prove to us that you have something to go back to, right? Which is reasonable, and, 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 uh, but that's, that's kind of the paranoia that exists um, because of this perception, and, the, and the, the, the U.K. is going through this perception right now, uh, in the last couple of years, too many migrants. And so what they're doing is they end up kicking out a whole bunch of skilled workers because of this fear that's domestic, even though the, the economics almost never supports this uh, uh, loss of, of social welfare from, migrate, from migration. I'm bringing this up because population is what we're going to be getting into later in this lecture. Um, another reason why command and control such as this, the CAFE standards or the permit system. Another reason why that, those kinds of systems, which are not economic systems, when I said on your briefings, do not use regulations unless you also use a market and, uh, or prices. I want you to talk about the flexibility that markets and prices give you in terms of incentives, right? So if someone says, hey, guess what? We're consuming too much fuel. Here's one way of dealing with that problem. We're going to make fuel, you'll, we'll make fuel standards. Everybody has to follow a fuel standard, even if you only drive 10 kilometers a week or you drive 10,000 kilometers a year or whatever, a month or something like that. The standards are one size fits all, right? Here's another one. You can only drive your car on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. The thing that the prices do, and, and just the very simplest thing here the price does, what can you do? Let me give some examples here. I want some examples out of you guys. What can you do? The price goes up. What happens? What can you do to save fuel? Four, four, four bucks a liter. Come on. Huh? Not her, you. Drive less, thank you. What else can you do? Change cars, what else can you do? Different kind of more efficient car. We're getting there. What else can you do? Good. What else can you do? You. No, you, you. You. Yeah. It's a tough one because these guys, they've had some easy ones. Don't say buy a car. Different car. Store gas or bulk. <laughs> right? You can, smuggle, you can smuggle gasoline, actually. This is what happens from Venezuela and Colombia because Venezuela sells their petrol for five cents a liter. And so everybody's smuggling it across the border, right? Iran, same problem. They have shortages. Other countries. So what you can do, another one, you can carpool, right? You can drive less. You could change where you live. But the government doesn't see that. They're like, you all have to get new cars. Oh, it's going to stimulate the economy, by the way. We're going to stimulate the economy. You have to throw away your, your two-year-old car, throw it away. You need a new car, right? Your big car, throw it away. You get a small car. That's how they're being efficient. The opportunity cost of this efficiency is tremendous, but you don't necessarily see that. You do see this, because people are like, ah, oh, they're freaking out. But you don't see this, all this ridiculous stuff that happens when they have those fuel economy standards. So the, the, the invisible versus the visible, the invisible pain is what no one sees. Everybody talks about it quietly. But the great thing about having this kind of thing, what you're getting into with the homework assignment is I'm saying, hey, look, 
if you can raise the price of fuel and you're not necessarily worse off, you'll figure it out when you do the homework. And the world is not going to go to hell, which is actually like in one big huge fireball of death, then maybe that's worthwhile. But that's just using the price mechanism. So this whole discussion of command and control, of regulation, of ways of managing resources, scarce resources, is based on um, a, it's, I mean, the, the word command and control is, 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 I'm using it over and over again, but it's exactly what it, what it means, it's exactly the problem. You have somebody who says, we have to do something, and I want to see an outcome. All the, no cars can drive during the Olympics. That's an outcome. I can measure that. I can measure that there's no cars. I can't measure the cost. Right? I see the, the benefit of the impact. And so, with, for somebody who has no imagination, this is a policy that makes sense. Even worse, they say, oh, I have a spreadsheet. And, oh, God, that's not even close to a spreadsheet. <laughs> not even a soup bowl. I have a spreadsheet, and I have 2,000... 12, I've got 2013, I got the future, 2000, whatever, 14, 2015, and I have uh, 100 cars here, and I use my spreadsheet, and I use minus 10%, and I go 90, and I have uh, 81, and then I have uh, 72. I have a nice little linear drop in cars because some intern can make a formula in a spreadsheet, right? That's my policy. And if I raise the, pr the price to a, a dollar fifty a liter, I don't know what's going to happen. It's terrible, the unknown. I'd rather have the certainty of a spreadsheet. Microsoft has been used to plan more economies into the ground than any other software out there, right? This false security of the spreadsheet, this false security of Mondays you can drive and Tuesdays you can't, it, may, it helps people miss the point. The point is to use less resources at the lowest cost, the lowest opportunity cost, right? That's what we're trying to get to. And it's, it's, that's, the, that's the limit of their, of their imagination. There was something else I was going to say about that, but I forgot. You don't notice it when you're just using resources on an everyday basis. Oh, the price mechanism. You don't notice the price mechanism when it's working. You go get a cup of coffee. Someone there has got coffee for you. The coffee came from across halfway around the world. Some, you go to the gas station. There, number one, there's gas. Number two, the lights are on. Number three, you can pump it. That came from potentially Alberta, but maybe halfway across the world. Very complicated products arrive in your house all the time in, in, into your, in, into your con consumption space based on the price system and the price mechanism. And what it does is it the reason I had you read Hayek very early in the semester is to try and get into the idea that maybe we don't all know the same thing. You know stuff that I don't know, and you and you and you, we all know different things. What the price system does is it allows us to coordinate our activities, coordinate our desires, coordinate our knowledge, and if we're talking about the distribution of iPhones, or we're talking about the distribution of petroleum, or we're even talking about the, distribution, the output of carbon in the world, you can use the price system to allocate each of those things. And guess what? You can even be efficient in terms of the equal marginal principle. This is all about efficiency and markets and economics and, and uh, maximizing benefit of resources. It's not about politics. Politics is about poverty and helping other people and security. Those things can be taken care of in a different system. But if you use the economics, the pricing, you can do a lot with resources. I mean, if, you, if, you, if I haven't said this a hundred times in this class, I mean, I'm saying it again, but you, you should, I want you to be appreciating that as we do this discussion. Um, okay, moving right along, the, this system works, of course, when we have 
the costs and benefits are internalized. If you pay the price of a cup of coffee and the price reflects all of the costs of the coffee, we got the cost of the farmer's time, the land, the distribution, the processing, the retail costs, and so on, then we're going to have an efficient situation. The problem is, of course, when we have those externalities. And usually it's a problem if it's a negative externality. No one really cares if it's a positive externality, although those are nice. So we talked before about private goods. And if you have cost and benefit inside the private goods, then you're going to be OK. You're going to have efficiency, right? If you have public goods, and by public, I mean non-excludable, which, so that also includes common, pool, common property resources. The cost that benefits, cost to uh, me benefits to you, then we're going to have an unhappy situation. This is, this is the summary of the class, right? This is happy, this is unhappy. That's the textbook. Right? If the costs and the benefits lie with the same person, if you make a decision, you say, hmm, these are the costs, these are the benefits, I'm going to make a decision. If all of those costs and all of those benefits are, in, are being internalized to you, you're going to make the right decision. This is why no one complains about what you have for lunch, or what you buy at the store to wear your clothing, right? or what you do with your time on television, or whatever. No one complains about that. The complaints come up when the costs go to me, and the benefits go to you. And that happens with these, mostly these common property resources. And in this class, we're talking about pollution. Water pollution, air pollution, noise pollution, and so on, right? No one really, if you sit there and say, someone says, oh, I'm hiring a, an employee. I'll hire you, Alex. How about I'll hire you for 20 bucks an hour? 30 bucks an hour. And he's like, oh, dude, I'll do it for 18. And you're like, oh, it's not fair. I deserve that money, right? But no one really complains when someone underbids you on a job. Or no one really complains when someone overbids you on an auction for a, a t-shirt on eBay or whatever, right? No one complains when you get beaten on price, but they sure do complain when you're exhausted or you're my neighbor, my stupid neighbor next door with his diesel truck at 6 o'clock in the morning, you know, and I wake up with this noise. That's a negative externality. And I try internal, internalize it. I talk to him. He says, fuck off. So that's even better, right? This is how you have warfare. Angry. Angry, right? That's what the class is about. We're trying to avoid those angry situations. We talked about this in terms of the free rider problem, of course. It's the exact same problem. The free rider problem is not about the externality. It's about who's going to fund the, the, co the costs of, of mitigating the externality. So say that we have a group of people here. These are all our people again. And we know that if everybody puts in, we've got 50 people in here. If everybody puts in, if we get $50 in total, we can, uh, we can get a cost. And then we can get a benefit of $100 in terms of uh, health, right? So what we're doing is we're saying, OK, everybody put in some money, put in a dollar each, put in a dollar each, and we're all going to have a water supply we can drink, right? It's a shared water supply. It's a water fountain. We can all drink from it. But it needs $50 of investment. Or it needs, yeah, it needs $50 of investment. And everybody's going to get $2 of benefit for $1 of investment. But if it's there, I, I, I need to mess with the math a little bit. But if everybody puts in, if, if there's enough money put in and the water, say it costs, let's make this equal here. Let's say it costs $25, right? It costs $25, there's 50 people. The first 25 people to put in the money create the benefit. Right? So you guys create the benefit. Now you guys can e enjoy the benefit at no cost. We know this is a problem. We know that 
you would prefer not to put in a dollar, you prefer them to put in a dollar, and vice versa, right? From a voluntary perspective, which is what Dolan talks about in the book, from a voluntary perspective, it can be very difficult to get an agreement on this. Because he talks about these, you know, these coalitions. You know, if, 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 if you get a $2 benefit, she gets a $3 benefit, you get a $4 benefit from the same common pool good, then it's hard to uh, get everybody to agree on, on whether or not to invest in it. Say it costs, say it costs $2 to, to do it. You don't want to put in, a, you, and it's worth a dollar to you. You don't want to put in $2, even though you're going to get a dollar benefit if it was existing. You don't want to put in $2 because you just break it even. You guys want to put in the money, but there's not enough of you to do it, or it's not fair. Right? So we get into this, this problem, the political problem, of trying to figure out who's going to um, contribute towards it. And, and Dolan doesn't have a solution for this, by the way. If you read through that chapter, he's like, he says, and this is a problem. Because he doesn't have a solution. In the end, it turns out to be politics, and politics turns out to be 51% voting to tax 100% of the people, right? But it can be, but there is scale that matters in terms of politics. And I think that's one thing. So, in, in, uh, if we have the situation in Canada, with the oil sands, we've got 30 million Canadians. Canadians. And we've got, uh, whatever, 3 million in Alberta. In Alberta, they're saying, hey, we're producing all this value for you guys. You're just taking our money. And there's a fiscal map. You can say that Alberta has flat cash flow flowing out. But on the other hand, Alberta's putting out a, a huge chunk of pollution on behalf of Canada, right? So if it's a federal thing, maybe 30 million are going to vote to tell Alberta what to do, and Alberta doesn't like that. Or maybe it's, it's put down, in, and Alberta is in charge of this, of this decision, and Alberta says, we're going to drill, we're going to pump a lot of oil, and the, and the rest of Canada is screwed. You can't really get a good, there's no good equilibrium here. It ends up being political reality. It's the same thing in, in China if Beijing says, you give us a bunch of resources and we'll use it ourselves, and the rest of the country is in trouble, right? Or the inside of Beijing, the outside of Beijing. All these political problems end up being who bears the cost and who bears the benefits. And if you can, if you can, if you can make it go into one spot geographically and you put all the costs and benefits in here and you have this box vote, that's okay. But if you have this, And here's the benefits. You've got a political problem. Because one group is definitely experiencing the cost. One group is definitely experiencing the benefits. There's a little bit of overlap. This is the efficient group here, in a way. But if, if, if you have to have, you know, this, if this is the way that that process works, then, then you've got um, trouble. Let's see. How about the benefits of, of CO2? We're going to burn carbon in Canada and in China and so on. Oh, who gets the cost of CO2? I don't know. What, maybe you live in the Maldives or in Bangladesh, right? You're going to be underwater because Canadians are driving their ski mobiles up to Tim Hortons. Their skidoos or whatever, right? So that is, that template, those two boxes, pretty much you can put a whole bunch of, of these problems into those, that same framework. And with climate change, it's ridiculous because you don't have Bangladeshis and Canadians voting on any kind of binding political mechanism. But even inside of countries, you've got this problem. And that ends up being the politicians, their biggest job, their biggest challenge is to resolve that problem. And guess what? It's hard on a good day if the politicians are also corrupt, it's very, very hard. And by corrupt, I mean they're going to either have, there's two kinds of corruption. I've talked about corruption more than once. There's two kinds of corruption. One is that I'm making money from this deal personally. So maybe I have uh, a, a coal producing company and I'm in the legislature and I'm gonna vote 
against anything that stops me from producing coal and making money. That's a pretty explicit personal corruption. Or I have a belief that is that coal is a great idea just because my daddy was in the coal business and I love coal, I like the look of it, the feel of it, or whatever. And I just have a personal belief, but my personal belief doesn't represent society's belief. If you're a politician and you don't represent your people, then you are corrupt by a, a very simple question, which is that you're not doing what's good for them. If you're selfish and corrupt, and, or so you're, you're corrupt in a different way, that you're a thief, then you're still not doing what's good for them, but you're definitely doing it for a much more explicit thing called, I'm, st I'm stealing money. That's a different kind of corruption. And politicians are supposed to be able to make these boxes come together, right? To make this beautiful three-dimensional artwork. There we go, it's a box. I just made that up, that was pretty good. I should do that more often. But that's how you square the, square the circle, so to speak. That's how you cube the, the squares. So you want everybody to be in the same thing. And po politically, what happens here when you're going to have those costs and benefits is what you do is you, you take some money or other things from the benefit side and you put it over into the cost side. That's how politics works. We're going to let you burn some oil, but we're going to give you guys compensation for the pollution. Or we're going to um, make sure the people who are getting benefits are paying bigger taxes, for example. If Alberta, the province of Alberta was paying a carbon tax to the federal government at the tune of $30 a ton, I don't think very, much, very many Canadians would be objecting to that situation, right? Uh, not ignoring the problem with local water pollution and so on, land pollution, but that would be a huge way of dealing with that externality. It's not happening for lots of interesting reasons, but it's the same in any other country. That is that is that is that is that. Okay, that's a whole bunch of stuff on free riders and so on. And our, our last two minutes, awesome. Population. Let me say one quick thing for population. That'll get you nice and motivated. The paradox of progress. In, 19, in the late 1960s, what began was called the Green Revolution. What that meant was high yield wheat, rice, corn, etc. High yield crops were engineered in the labs. This is pre-GMO, but it's the same idea. They were making hybrid crops. And what they, found, what they ended up finding out, this is based on the whole Malthusian discussion, remember. What they ended up getting is, from a piece of land, they used to get 100 units of crops, 100 units of, of calories, for example. They were getting 300 units of calories. They were tripling production. It was a very, very big deal, the Green Revolution. Norman Borlaug was the guy who... Uh, was very important with this, and I believe he got a Nobel Peace Prize. He's known as the guy who saved a billion people's lives by helping them eat. The Green Revolution, did it increase the supply or the demand for food? Supply of food, right. Well, this is an interesting question from an economic perspective. Here's aggregate demand for food, and here's supply. And Norman Borlaug and everybody with him, they uh, shifted supply in or out. They increased supply, supply curve goes out. Well, now we've got a lot more food at a lower cost. And if we looked at, in the, in the short term, more people could eat more calories. Everybody was going to get more full in their bellies. Right? This happened in China, by the way, in the, 
in the, uh, the late 70s. This is the first, the first reforms in China that were meaningful were the agricultural reforms, right? Household responsibility. So what happened is, in the short term, everybody got a little bit more fat. What happened nine months later? <laughs> Almost. What'd you say? They got really fat. Nice try. <laughs> nine months. What's the number here, guys? Babies. Lots of babies, right? Because the baby function, the baby production function, is a question of quantity or quality of food, right? The baby production function is also uh, depends on how likely it is your baby's going to die, which is a baby health thing. But what happened is supply of food, food increased and population started going like this. So we're not quite sure if the Green Revolution was good for humanity. And we'll start with that topic on Tuesday.